Open your Bibles with me this evening to the book of Exodus as we continue our study through Exodus. Tonight we turn to Exodus chapter 20 and in the final verses after the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, and tonight we're looking at verses 18 through 26. This evening's sermon is entitled, The Purpose of His Presence. And in it, I want to examine the question, why would God speak to us? Why would He come down and dwell amongst us? Why would He take any consideration as, as, as to us? And what is the purpose of His presence dwelling in us and around us and through us? And especially even way back here in the book of Exodus, before the Holy Spirit or, or Christ, who is God with us, before any of those things, what is God's presence the purpose of it on Mount Sinai as he descends and gives the Ten Commandments and the people see all of these things. And so we'll examine that question tonight, looking at Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 18. Let's read God's word. All the people perceive the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But let not God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that the fear of him may remain with you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while God approached the th- while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make other gods besides me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. You shall make an altar of earth for me. And you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it out of cut stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar, so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. One of the things that I noticed that was very strange to me, uh, and I, I don't know if this is everybody's experience, but as, as an educator, one of the things that I've noticed in my own experience that is very strange to me, uh, I started out at Raw Springs with a group of uh, students in each class of about 14 to 16 on, on, on the good days when everybody showed up to class. That's a small group of kids for a public school. The most I've had uh, at Stone Elementary School has gotten up to uh, 29, and at times I have put with other teachers in the room, mind you. I have put 60 kids just a, a couple of weeks ago in, in my classrooms, and we, we effectively taught 50, 60 kids all in the same group at one time. And one time, I put in my little classroom the entire fifth grade, 100 kids. Now, that day, we did, a, we did put on a movie in front of them. But it, it, there, were, there were that many there. And I, what I've noticed is, after being a, a first-year teacher and really understanding how to do classroom management, all those things. Once you get enough people doing the right thing, they actually all start to kind of group think and the class clowns kind of get weeded out. There's some who are always going to be the class clown, like me and Clay at choir practice. But but once you once you weed that out and, and, you, and you get everybody else under control, there, there's just these two or three that you have to worry about. It, it's it's the, the settling in of, of all of these people doing the, the same things. This this proximity of all of the other people, the peers around you following directions and getting rewarded for it and getting praised for it makes you won't do the same thing. And here it's not the proximity of your peers, but it's God's proximity of presence that brings about a right doing in the Christian and in this case in the Jews here at Mount Sinai's life. And so the first thing I think we're going to see as we look at the purpose of God's presence here is in these first three verses, 18, 19, 20, and I guess that's four verses, and 21, we're going to see that God's proximity of his presence, God's presence is going to curb our appetite for sin. Let's look first at verse 18. Much like a verse from chapter 19, where they first arrived at Sinai, we have the similar types of awesome presence of God here in verse 18. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. 
It's interesting that you use the term perceived here as if it, it's not really happening. But I think the, ter- the terminology of perceiving something here is to show us that while they did not see lightning and thunder, it was like lightning and thunder. While they did not hear literal trumpets, God's voice was like a trumpet. While the mountain was not on fire, it was as if the mountain was on fire. This perception of these awesome things that are happening, and the reality is it's even worse than this because of the great mystery of God and how in the world is all this happening. And so all of these things are going on there as that's taking place. And when the people saw it, verse 18 says, they trembled and stood at a distance. Here we see again that amazing power of God. What God can do these things, can appear in in such a frightful way. And as such, it, it, it brings the people to this very emotion of fear. They trembled and they stand back from this God. God's presence ought to bring about in us some type of fear. He is not a God that we should play with him or that we we should think that we can take his commandments lightly and his word lightly and his truth lightly or, or, or that we're in charge and in control of things. He is a God who ought to be feared. In fact, we see it many other places. And if you'll grab your Bibles tonight, we're going to be flipping first to Revelation. We see in many places in God's word that those um, who encounter God in in any type of way find themselves in in, in a frightful situation. You know, it's often said of every time there's angels in the Bible, I like to clean up the misconception that art has brought to us that angels are these beautiful creatures who if we were to see them, we'd say, oh, look at that little naked baby with wings. That's not exactly how they look because we can determine this by the fact that every time an angel appears, what's the first thing out of their mouth? Fear not. There's something to be afraid of. These supernatural beings who are not God, but they're they're, they're these supernatural beings that accompany God. God is a God to be feared. And when John, the revelator in Revelation chapter 1, sees Jesus in his fully glorified um, uh, appearance here in Revelation, look what he does. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 he sees and describes Jesus, and there's, there's some frightening things here. Some are symbolic. His eyes like flames of fire, his feet burnished with bronze, a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, his face like a sun shining in his strength. And then in verse 17, we get John's reaction to the appearance of Jesus. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Did John pass out? Did he just play dead? Play possum from an earlier sermon, maybe. Uh, what, was, what was the reaction? It, it was at least that he recognized my life is in this one's hands. To fall prostrate before someone in ancient days was a symbol of falling on one's face and belly to say, you can kill me or you can heal me or you can help me. or you, you, My life's in your hands. And this is exactly what Jesus does when he speaks to him in verse 17. After he falls like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. He says something akin to those angels. Yes, we ought to have some fear, but at the same time, Jesus says some things, and angels say some things, like, don't be afraid. But here, his presence is a fearsome one. It's one that should bring about these emotions of fear. And I think the reason why fear is something that we, we, we get out of a reaction with God, yes, it, it's scary, uh, the thunder and the lightning and the sound of trumpets and the smoking mountain. It, it's dangerous. But when we really take in who this God is, it's not necessarily his danger that keeps the people trembling and at a distance. It's the difference between the people and God. Yes, there is. He is, he is strong and I am weak. But there's also the reality, and they've noticed this, that God is holy and we are not. In fact, that's the context here in Exodus chapter 20. What has God just got done saying? He has laid out the Ten Commandments. You've got to follow all of these rules. And as such, now he shows himself in this frightening way, and the people shrink back from him. They're in fear of him. It is 
in his presence, in recognizing that he is holy and we are not, that we are sinners and he is not, that shows us this is a God whom we should fear. And if we understand not only this aspect of the Bible, but looking forward into Revelation even even deeper to the last of times, what's going to happen? But because of our sin, we're going to stand before the Almighty Judge And one day, we're going to have to give an account for everything we've done in this life. And we will stand before this judge, and it won't be because of his great strength, but because of his great strength and his great holiness at the same time, that we should shudder and fear in front of him. Lest we have Jesus, the only one who can stand in our place in that day. And in verse 19, we we see something similar to this as as the people respond to these... um, these sightings. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Here they request that Moses might speak and might give all of the directions that the things that have already occurred, remember Moses has been the mouthpiece and Aaron before him and Aaron and Moses at the same time in some instances, before the, before the Lord on behalf of the people and in order that they might hear from the Lord through Moses and through Aaron. But now God has spoke in the, the, the hearing of all these people, and he has spoken these Ten Commandments that they might all hear them. And as they see all of these things happening and they hear the words of the Lord, they're asking, let's go back to the way things used to be. When you approached God, when you saw God, don't let us go any closer, don't let us hear from well, Let's Let's just keep it that way. They're scared of a relationship and a closeness and proximity to the presence of God. And I believe it's because of what he's just spoken. What again has he just spoken? But the Ten Commandments. These laws and these words that he's just spoken resonate in the hearts of the Israelites that the outcome must be, when God speaks, I will surely die. In fact, I think it's, it's, it's like unto the garden. Think back to Genesis chapter 2. They're in the garden. They're, they're getting the mandate of being fruitful and multiplying, of cultivating the garden, of naming the animals, of all of these things. And then God gets to, to the details at the very end, and he says, but there's one thing you shouldn't do. You can eat of any tree in the garden, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Here's where it all all makes sense, I think. For the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. The words of the Lord, when broken, what do they lead to? Death. And I think in a way here, the Jews understand this. The Israelites understand this. Here are the Ten Commandments given, and they recognize the words that he's just spoken have condemned me to death. We actually see that in multiple places in the New Testament, when Paul looks back over the Ten Commandments and the 613 laws of the Old Testament for the Israelites, that his whole takeaway is, what does it bring about in the life of a man when he looks into the perfect law? But death, brought on by sin, for we cannot satisfy it. Flip now with me to Romans chapter 7. What God has just spoken, this law, and their response to it and knowledge of it brings about death. And Paul knows this full well and speaks of it in Romans chapter 7. Really, I would say the entire chapter, and it's, it's been building from chapters before in Romans, is about this topic. But in chapter 7, verse 7, we'll begin with his understanding of what the law does. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Again, it's building on much that he's already previously said. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Romans 7 verse 8. But sin, 
taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. His whole purpose here is to say that when a sinner confronted by the law of God stands in the the words of God and recognizes without any change that their sin is at conflict with the words of God, it brings about exactly what the Israelites have said. If we listen and hear God speaking to us, we will die. For the sin in their hearts versus the law that God has put before them cannot be reconciled. We're sinners. and We cannot keep this law that he's given us. And so God's presence here is sent in order to curb this very sin. God reaches down and comes in this moment after giving the Ten Commandments and, yes, makes them realize this is a holy God. But what we see in verse 20 of Exodus chapter 20 is that it stands for a purpose. God has come down and dwells amongst the people here in order that it might curb their appetite for sin. Verse 20, Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Much like Revelation chapter 1, much like the angelic statements. Here Moses stands in, you know, the word angel in Hebrew is actually the same word for messenger. And so he stands in here as an angel, as a messenger of the Lord. And he says the same thing, do not be afraid. For God has come in order to test you, to test their faith, to see if they would prove true to their statement before in chapter 19, all the words that you have said we will do. And in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. The purpose of his presence, firstly, is that in his presence, we recognize he is an awesome, fearsome God who, in recognizing the law that he's given us, we do not want to sin, for we recognize the penalty of it. When we look at his great stature, when we look at all that he's done, when we look at his power and his supernatural abilities, even though the law frightens us, for we've sinned and fallen short of it, His presence makes it such that we do not want to sin against Him. When we're close to God, when we fear Him and recognize His high standards for us, both of which do reveal our sinfulness, curbing our appetite for sin comes about in the presence of God. Whether it be a person who is a steadfast Christian and knows that they will stumble for they are not perfect, but they trust in a perfect God, or whether it be a person who thinks by their own merit, they wrongly think this, but they think by their own merit that they can fulfill the law of God. The reality is when they come to the presence of God, when they find him in his word, when they see him in a supernatural way as the Israelites do, when they come before him in worship, this drawing near to God reveals the sin sin in us and desire to not be this way any longer. This is the first like tier of what it means to be a Christian. Before I can explain salvation to anyone, I first have to explain before the good news, the bad news. What's the bad news? That you're a sinner. That God has told you this is how you should be. This is how he's created you. And at every turn, you've let him down. That's the bad news. And that has to be the first tier before we can ever understand why a Savior would come or what He can do for me. We have to recognize our need for a Savior. And it's recognized when God's presence comes and we recognize how holy He is and how holy we are not. And in those moments, it brings about a desire to run from sin. Verse 21 And so the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. And I think this distance here that the people continue to have, again, is seen all the way back in the garden. 
when they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what immediately happens? They realize they were naked and they hid from God. And then God says, where are you? There's a separation, a distance in relationship between man and God. Sin brings this along. And when it's exposed, it is characteristic of all of us who, apart from Christ, are distant from God. This is the need for salvation. That not only are you a sinner, and if you don't turn from your ways, you're going you're gonna to risk hellfire for eternity. But the God who created you and desires to know you, your relationship with him is strained so long as sin is in your life and it's uncovered by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is salvation. And in Exodus chapter 20, verse 21, it, it ends here with Moses approaching the thick cloud where God was. God's spoken. He's revealed himself. And in chapter 19, it, it actually ended in, in, in chapter 19 of Exodus with Moses' command to go up the mountain. Um, if you look back with me at Exodus 19.24, after, after a long talk with Moses about how the people should behave and what's about to unfold, he gets this command. Then the Lord said to him, go down and come up again. He's already gone up to God one time on the mountain. That was the first time we had the thunder and the lightning and the trumpet. And then he comes back down for what? You and Aaron with you, but don't let the priests and the people break through to come up against the Lord or he'll break forth upon them. And so Moses goes down to the people and tells them. And so chapter 19 ends with him departing back down the mountain. And then the Ten Commandments are given before all the people. That's Exodus chapter 20. Now we have Moses going back up in verse 21. He's going up in the thick cloud where God was this time, it appears, by himself. And this brings us to the the rest of the story here tonight in Exodus chapter 20. In verses 22 all the way through the end of the chapter to verse 26, it's going to be God and Moses. And God is going to be revealing things to Moses um, that the people are not present for. But in, in this first section, we see that God's presence is here to recognize that sin in us. The next section I want to look at is verses 22 through 24. Then the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make other gods before me, gods of silver or gods of gold, and you shall not make them for yourselves. You shall make me an altar of earth for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen, and every place where I cause my name to be remembered. I will come to you and bless you. I think there's people in our lives who, there's many a reason, don't don't get it twisted. There's many a reason to go around them, but you want to go over, you want to spend time with them, you want to buddy up to them because you know at the end of it, you're going to get a blessing. Not in a selfish way, but you just know that this person is, is is just full of blessing. My uncle, he would come, he, he lives in Florida, and he would come to Meridian as a kid. And I knew when Uncle Lindsay came to town, this is going to be bad. It's, gonna, it's a bad look for a preacher. I knew he was going to stop by and get some fried chicken. I, I, it's, it's from an early age this has started, you see. And seriously, he would go by, and there's this place, I can't even remember it. it. It was the chicken basket. Hallelujah. Thank you for my wife. It was the chicken basket, and if if you go to a Meridian now, I don't know if they have a chicken basket anymore. I heard they opened up a location on North Hill Street. Uh, it, it looked suspicious. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. The chicken came out, and it looked more gray than it did golden. But 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 listen, listen, listen. It was just the chicken basket flavor. It was just something about, and when you pop these little chicken tenders and chicken nuggets and chicken legs in your mouth, yeah, there was there was nothing. It, it was so crispy. Whatever they were using, it was throwing the, the color off, but it was up in the flavor. And Uncle Lindsay, he would come through, and without a doubt, they would be running 12 hours behind schedule. But we would sit up and we would wait because we knew dinner was going to be there when he got there. I mean, he, w- he would bless you in that way. And we, we knew that they were going to bring, his family was going to bring the video games because they were big video game folks. And uh, so we knew he was just going to have a good time. And they'd stay down in Meridian for like two weeks at a time. And that was just the best time of my summer break. Now, I can tell you the other side of that when he made me get up and cut the grass all the time. I mean, this man, he'd cut the grass three times a week if you allowed it. I don't, I don't know what it was. And he, he'd do it. Uh, you know how I feel about grass. And so 
the chicken though. Hallelujah. And me and Adrian, we actually went and we stayed with him. This is early in our marriage. Uh, we went up to Atlanta for something and we went to Uncle Lindsay's house. We got in late that night. And what do we, what does he do? But he piles us up in his truck and we go to some suburb area my mall that just pops up in the middle of nowhere outside of Atlanta. And we go and he feeds us just this, the nicest dinner. And we go home and we go to sleep and we wake up and he is up hours before us. And y'all, I ain't never had a breakfast like this before. He cooked biscuits and bacon and sausage and danishes and cupcakes and bagels and I, it, just anything you could, grits and eggs. And it was just everything. And I was like, there's three of us, dude. And he just, he just cooked it. He just made it. And I'm, I want to be around him. I want to see him because he's, he's my uncle. Yes. But also, there's blessings when you come around Uncle Lindsay. There's people like that in our life, right? When they invite you out, you, you know they're going to pick up the check. They're going to bless you. They're, they're going to do things for you that nobody else would do because that's how they show their love. And I, I, would, I, would, I love to be loved that way. But the Lord loves us in a way much greater than this. If there's people in our life we want around us because of the blessings that they have to offer, how much more can the God who gives every good and perfect gift give us? And so this is the next reason we want to enter into his presence. Yes, because it curbs our appetite for sin, as we've already seen, but also in verses 22 through 24, that he is a God who blesses. Verse 22 says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. Notice what God says here. You yourselves have seen that I've spoken to you from heaven. The first thing God notes is the distance between them. But despite the distance, God has overcome this barrier of heaven and earth, and he has spoken from heaven that earth might hear. God has come and he has brought himself close in order that he might bless. And this is a gap that, that God has traversed, not only here, but time and time again for his people. In fact, this is the incarnation. Adrian actually said it this week, that this is the most quoted Bible verse scripture of my ministry. But it is because it's one of my favorite verses. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, 6, 7, on through 11. Where was, where was Christ? He was God, but he did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. But he humbled himself, coming to earth in the form of a bondservant, in the form of a man. And more than this, he humbled himself even to the point of death, to death on the cross. This is what God has traversed, that though he deserves to sit on the throne in heaven, he said, I'm going to come down and I'm going to dwell amongst men. He doesn't just do it here in Exodus, but he does it in the most profound way in Christ. And in verse 23, he not only notes the presence, but he speaks of those things that would be barriers to his presence. Verse 23, you shall not make other gods besides me. Gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make them for yourselves. Here God is noting that his presence is diluted by the fashioning of other false gods, false gods who have not traversed the same gap that he has. Think of it. When God of heaven reaches down and comes to earth, and he per, he's perceived in all of these wonderful ways that we see in verse 18, what happens for a god of gold and silver to come down? They're already down. They're fashioned by men's hands. There's nothing special. There's, they're of the earth, and they come to those on the earth, and they only come by men's hands to men. There's nothing special. There, there's, there's nothing that, that they have traversed. There's no gap that they've crossed in order to come to mankind for their false gods. God recognizes, look what I've done. Look at the distance I would go, and look at the distance that they've gone. Nowhere. Instead, God has blessed us not by an idol of silver or gold, but by his very presence in the flesh. In the oracle to Mary and to David, 
excuse me, to, to Joseph. He says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, you shall name him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. He has truly come as God with us into our world. No other God can do this. This is what's so important and, and, and fundamental of the incarnation. That there's never been a God who has come and dwelt amongst us. God has no need. It's the question we've asked at the very beginning. Why would he come into our world? Why would he come and be present amongst us? That he might restore our relationship. And even more, that he might bless us. But in verse 24, he, he, he counters this and he asks that the people too would traverse this barrier of earth to heaven. You shall make an altar of earth for me. And you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. God does does ask the people to send to him across this great divide. And he asks of sacrifices of worship. And here we might say, well, you know, that, that's what the Israelites did. That's, that's not for us anymore. I would agree with you. We don't need to, to give peace offerings and burnt offerings of sheep and oxen in every place where he causes his name to be remembered. But the same supernatural thing of God stepping down and speaking to us, and in return he asks that we would send worship back up to him, is done today. We've done it even now. And that when we gather as his people, as, as we take up offerings, as we send up songs of praise, as we petition him, as we did yesterday for several hours, and petitioning him for prayers for Israel, when we do all of these things, these are forms of worship where we in turn recognize that God has come near, that we might return our praise and worship even far, for he is not far from us. He has come near to us. And all of these things helps us to recognize what is said in this last verse, verse 24. I will come to you and bless you. The presence of God brings blessings to us, both by his presence amongst us and by us traversing this gap, oh, by his help, only by his help, in order that we might enter into his presence even here. This last verse and this promise, I will come to you and bless you, I think is exactly what Jesus means when he says, where two or more are gathered, I'm there in your midst. Jesus is promising, even when he's not physically present any longer, It's in the gathering and in the worship and in the prayers and in the praise and the thanksgiving. It's in all of these things that where will he be? But he'll be in our midst again. He will traverse it every time when his people call upon his name. He comes into our world to curb our appetite for sin, to bless us, and finally to show us that we should revere him. I remember when I was a child in church, I remember Miss Robin, my my kingdom kids leader, or and she was also the Sunday night person. She was she was the everything children related person. And I remember them kids one night. I don't know if we just built the Kool-Aid everywhere or we ran through the church or we I don't know what we did, but we broke one of the Baptist rules of of how you're supposed to act in church. And she Got us, because I can, I can remember to this day, and to show us there's reverence in God's house. The things that we learn as, as church kids growing up, that, hey, you, you need to go to the bathroom before service. You need to try to hold it through service, not to be a distraction to others. You, you need to make sure that uh, you, you don't run in the sanctuary. You need to make sure that you, well, this isn't a problem in Brooklyn, that you have your shoes on in the sanctuary. Uh, you need to make sure that you, you don't do this and that. and the, there's, there's all sorts of rules, right? For what purpose? Because this is, at least socially in, in the Baptist South, this is how we show reverence for God's house and his sanctuary. God ends these passages on the Ten Commandments and his, his presence before the people with giving two strange rules. And I think the same purpose is true. Even though the rules are quite strange, it's to show that when we're in his presence, we're to revere him. Let's look first at verse 25. 
If you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it with cut stones, for if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it. Here God gives what I like to call the rule of the rock. If you get a rock and you're going to turn it into an altar, don't touch it. Don't mar it in any way other than the way you found it. Don't fashion it in any way. It's interesting that this would come after him just getting through saying you shouldn't fashion gods of silver and gold. I think the idea here is don't be tempted to worship the architecture of the altar more than you worship the one whose altar it is. More than this, don't, don't, don't fall into the idolatry of worshiping the architect of the altar more so than the one whose altar it actually is. And so here he, he reminds them to follow this rule. This is how he wants to be worshiped, for he understands how it might turn out. If for no other reason, I'm, I'm guessing what God's intention here is, if for no other reason, God said, this is the type of rock he wants to be worshiped on, and we should do it. For he's a God who we should respect, and we should honor, and we should revere. <laughs> Likewise, my favorite rule here, verse 26. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar, so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. We were talking right before service of Brother Taylor was not dressed as a preacher. He had uh, he had still come up here in his his flippy floppies and his his shorts, and he was about to change and transform into a minister. And I believe it was Christy, and she said, "You you look like Jesus." And I said, "Yes, but um, Jesus wore a robe, and uh, I don't I don't think I need to wear a robe, especially in context of, of tonight's sermon." For the priests of the Old Testament day wore a robe, and if the wind blew just right, and they're walking up the steps to to God's altar, their nakedness might be exposed on it. And God here is is not saying this for a for a for a joke at the end of it all. It is it is silly in our, in our culture and in our context. But what's the reality of it? That there might be no distractions before Him. That there might might be any humiliation before Him. That when we enter into His presence, we recognize and respect Him for the God that He is. In this moment, on His altar, He is to be revered. And this is the third thing that we learn. By the presence of God, he is to be revered. He cares how he's worshipped. He cares about the attitude that we come before him with in faith. He cares about the humiliation that could possibly occur. He cares because God is a God who should be taken seriously, who is worthy of our devotion and our reverence and our respect. And so what's God's presence for? Why does he dwell in our midst? Why are there these these places and these times where we can feel his presence so sincerely? What's it for? How should we respond to it? We should recognize, as we first noted, that when we come into the presence of God, expect that your sin is going to be revealed. Expect to be convicted. And in this, recognize the almighty, fearsome God who is in control of all things and who will be the judge in the last day. Recognize in God's presence the great blessings that overflow. It should give us a desire to come into his house, to enter into his word, to come before him in prayer, for in those moments, there are the most sincere blessings that we could ever encounter in this life. And finally, when we enter into his presence, we should recognize as he is a fearsome God, he is a God who is worthy of honor and glory and praise. His reverence is foremost in all of these things. He is not a God that we should come to thinking that what we do before him is frivolous or silly, but instead, he is a God who should be honored. And all of this, Exodus always points forward, doesn't it? It all points to who would come in Christ. A God who would pay for my sin. A God who would give me the greatest blessing in salvation. And a God who, Philippians chapter 2, ends by saying, because he humbled himself, because he became a man, because he became a bondservant, because he humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. It brings God glory that his name would be the name of all other names. At the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess to the glory of God the Father. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God who dwells amongst us. That you are a God who in these days has even sent your Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And Lord, we thank you that through your presence, you would show and prove to us so many things. Lord, I pray as we've spent today in your house that you have convicted us of our sin and that we would take note of it and desire to reconcile it. Lord, in entering into your presence, Lord, I hope that we leave here this evening after a day full of worship, recognizing that you have poured out your blessing on us just in in being present and near to you. And Lord, I pray that as we recognize who you are and what you've done, that you would help us to give you the praise that you're due, for you are God who is worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of reverence and honor and glory. Lord, we ask that as we leave from here that you'd be with us and that you'd keep us safe until we return together and unite again as your church. Lord, we ask that as we go out from here that you would put your name upon our lips, that your gospel might go with us and that we might share it with those who are lost and dying in order that they might experience the same truth in your presence that we have discussed here tonight. Lord, we ask that you'd be with us and we ask all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.